Hi, thank you for having me. My name is Isabel and I am currently still employed at the University of Plymouth as an environmental psychologist, but I'm soon making my way back to Norway to the NTNU, where I also did my PhD a couple of years ago on sustainable seafood consumption. And I um, call myself an environmental psychologist and my focus areas are behavior change and evaluation of interventions and um, developing effective strategies for communication and communication techniques. And the areas I mainly work in are related to the marine environment, like for example, plastic pollution and behaviors connected to plastic pollution, but also um, fisheries or sustainable seafood consumption or tourism, but also other areas um, that are not related to the marine environment directly, like, for example, plastic in the desert or water quality um, in the Peruvian Andes, for example. And the main projects I'm working in or the project I'm working in at the moment is called Blue Communities, and that is on sustainable development and marine management in different um, biodiversity sites in Southeast Asia. And the project I will work on in the future is called Nature in Your Face, that's on um, at NTNU. And that is uh, focused on four different case study sites in Norway, and one of them is related to plastic waste as well. So as an environmental psychologist, I focus on the relationship between humans and nature. And I'm focusing on this relationship from both directions. So how do we as humans affect nature and how does nature affect us? And you can imagine that as for example, you walk along the beach and it is um, sunny and the wind is in your hair and it's all like really clean and the water is lovely and you probably um, have a well-being effect. You feel better, your mood gets better, you have the feeling of relaxation and a recreational effect. However, if this beach is littered and there's a lot of plastic rubbish around you and you maybe even cut your foot on a piece of plastic, your well-being might not be that good anymore um, and might even decline. So that's an example of how nature can affect us positively or negatively. And then for the other direction, how we affect nature, environmental psychology mostly focuses on consumer decisions. For example, how does my decision to use a single-use plastic cup um, as compared to my keep cup affect nature, carbon emissions or waste? Maybe this cup ends up in the ocean or how does my decision to use my bike as compared to my car um, affect my carbon emissions? And as environmental psychologists, we focus on this decision on the choice process and on the behavioral drivers. Like why do we behave in a certain way? And why is it sometimes that we already know so much about pro-environmental behavior and still make the, un, um, the, the non-environmental choice? So this is basically what environmental psychology is about. As a psychologist, I'm mainly focusing on human behavior and mental processes, but what does this have to do with plastic? And I would say it has a lot to do with plastic. What we see here on the right, we have the whole um, yeah, life cycle of plastic. On the top, we have the economy sector. So we have producers who use plastic um, as part of their products, like the automotive industry uses a lot of plastic for certain parts of their cars, or there's plastic in cosmetic products either in the cosmetic product itself or as the cosmetic product packaging. We have plastic used in agriculture to cover the crops and um, so many more sectors that use plastic. The second um, sector that we see in the middle is the society. So we have the people who use plastic materials in cities and villages. And then we have the environment on the bottom, so the marine and the terrestrial environment, and usually we wouldn't find any plastic in this sector. However, there are decisions and behavior across this whole cycle that um, cause plastic ending up in the environment. So if you imagine in the economy sector again, there are people who think that plastic is the best material for their certain part of their car. Um, there are people in the cosmetics industry who think that adding uh, little micro beads into their cosmetics is just a great idea because it's the best material for their certain purpose. And then there are consumers who think that buying this certain product is a good idea because it just fulfills their purpose at that moment in time. 
and the consumers can either um, tell the producer that this product is great um, and therefore therefore reinforce the production of this product or they reject it and tell the producer no this product is not great so the consumers have a certain power to support and reject products and then there are people um, or decisions and behavior that determine plastic ending up in the environment, either deliberately or non-deliberately. So this can be by littering, so actively putting plastic into the environment or by um, like undeliberately not doing the right recycling choice or maybe plastic that gets lost in the system, blown away by the wind and then washed into the ocean. There are also decisions and behavior that might help recover plastic from the environment again, people picking up the plastic, people joining beach cleans. And also um, when I point back to the talk that was done by Helene Lindberg and um, her company Noprec, they use plastic, like plastic that was first uh, like wasted or like um, disposed of, they use this plastic and make new little plastic granules of it. And that points back to um, on the top left of this graph, you have the recycling um, area. So plastic can also be re reused and put back again into the whole process. And then there's this other talk that was um, given in your webinar series by Luyanda Hiachabo about the reclaimers. So they would be down um, at the bottom bit. So they would be the ones who pick up the plastic and put a new value on it. So there are many different ways of how plastic can end up in the environment and how plastic can also be recovered from the environment. Unfortunately, the blue arrows that um, point towards recovery of plastic are less than the red arrows that mean loss into the system. But um, bottom line, decisions and behavior really determine how and how much and what kind of plastic ends up in the environment. Before I move on to behavior change, I would like to talk a little bit about the costs of plastic pollution. And I don't only mean the monetary costs. First, um, I'm using a slide from the Limnoplast webinar series. And here, Mateusz Wiopolski pointed towards the money that it costs if plastic is littered. So just the cleanup costs and the loss of economic value in Europe alone is about 800 million US dollars per year. In total, if you add it all together, it's about three, 13 billion US dollars per year that we pay directly and indirectly for plastic pollution. However, this is just the economic cost. It's really high. But on top of that, there are also costs on our health and on ecosystem services. So ecosystem services is what we get from nature. For example, recreation or fisheries or um, air, the air we breathe is also an ecosystem service. And this study that was conducted by colleagues from the Plymouth Marine Laboratory not only puts a price tag on plastic pollution, but they also investigated how does plastic pollution compromise ecosystem services and does it have effects on the human well being? And what they found was that all ecosystem services provided by the ocean are compromised by plastic pollution to a certain degree and they also found negative effects on human well-being so we also have decreased um, like mental health not only um, risks to our physical health but also to our mental health because of plastic pollution there's more evidence that plastic pollution costs more than just money this is a study by um, Kaylee Wiles and Sabina Powell and their colleagues. And what they did here was that they used the pictures of um, environments of beaches and looked at um, mental well-being effects. So it is a well-known effect that if we look at nature, at beautiful nature, like forests or beaches or the ocean, that it has a positive effect on our well-being. We feel better. However, what happens if um, there is there are items in this nature? So on the first picture, this is basically the unspoiled beach. Then we have um, a picture of the beach with natural rubbish on it, like um, algae, for example. Then we have uh, one beach that they photoshopped in fishing waste, fishing litter, like nets. 
And um, the last one is picnic litter. So um, boxes uh, of food and so on. And interestingly, the last picture had the most negative well-being effects because people perceived that as disrespectful. So it was perceived as this rubbish has been left there deliberately. And this is why the mental well-being effects were the worst. Then um, the participants reported that the fishing litter could have ended up there accidentally, like washed up on the beach, but um, the picnic litter was left there deliberately. And this is why it has strong negative effects on people. The last study along that line that I would like to point out is this one. Um, here, Kaylee Wiles and her colleagues looked at the effects of beach cleans and other activities along the ocean. So they had people walking along the beach, people doing rock pooling and people um, engaging in a beach clean. And the beach clean was superior as compared to the other activities in terms of meaningfulness and positive emotion. So people gained quite a lot from cleaning the beaches and um, felt really happy about it and felt it was a meaningful activity. It is questionable, however, if you would repeat the same activity at the same beach week and week again and the rubbish always comes back if it still has these positive effects so probably there would be a point where people feel very frustrated but on the other hand i remember that from your webinar series the um, talk by linda godfrey she pointed out that in order to meet the um, sustainable goals for reduction of rubbish we need to engage about four billion people into the waste sector across the world. And um, so this not only would have economic benefits for people joining the waste industry, but also probably uh, mental health benefits because they have a meaningful activity and um, it increases their mood and maybe is supportive for their mental well-being. Right. So now we heard that decisions and behavior drive plastic pollution. And we also heard that plastic pollution has negative effects on our well-being and our mental health and on ecosystem services. So how can we now change it? And how does behavior change work exactly? Um, unfortunately, behavior change is quite difficult and quite complex. So I won't give you a straightforward answer to this, unfortunately. However, um, I can give you some pointers. So human behavior is determined and driven by a whole large number of factors. And this is just a small selection of them. So there are definitely more factors that drive human behaviors. And critically, these factors, they change from behavior to behavior and from person to person and from situation to situation. So it is getting quite difficult to pinpoint the exact driver of a behavior um, and kind of develop a solution for this particular behavior that always works. We often hear that we need to raise awareness in people that the reason for people misbehaving in terms of environmental protection is a lack of awareness. However, what environmental psychology research shows is that behavior, uh, that uh, awareness and knowledge is a very weak predictor of behavior. And if you think of your own behavior, for example, um, in terms of health, like we all know that healthy diets is very good for us and we should eat healthy every day. Unfortunately, we don't do that. Um, definitely not every day. So knowledge and awareness does not necessarily directly predict behavior. It is one important predictor, but it is not enough. And if you want to develop uh, an intervention for behavior change or a campaign, you first have to identify your specific behavior. Then you need to identify the behavioral drivers, and that can be social norms, it can be emotions, it can be situational constraints that have to be removed, it can be habits, attitudes, values, perceived behavioral control, or a whole combination of them. And the best way to find out what the drivers of your behaviors are is to get to know the people you want to talk to and to get to know your audience, your collaborators, and your study area. So there is a whole range of behaviors that relate to plastic pollution across the whole um, chain again. 
So in, and there are also lots of different people that we would have to engage with. In the first box, the raw materials box, it would probably be politicians that we have to talk to. And the specific behavior we could find or determine would be not drill oil in the Arctic, um, just as a random example. Then the second box is the production sector. And the people we would talk to would probably be from the industry, from companies. And a specific behavior would be increasing the percentage of recycled materials into your product or swapping the packaging of your product from plastic to paper. The third and fourth box would probably be consumers. And those consumers can be a whole variety of people. It can be mothers, it can be students, it can be um, old people, young people. So um, it's not a one group of consumers that are all the same. Of course, consumers are uh, like very different from each other. And specific behaviors could be choosing a certain product or rejecting it, disposing correctly or incorrectly. And then the last um, little circle that I put on the bottom would be um, the would probably be NGOs that we would talk to here, like NGOs that initiate beach cleans or social groups that initiate beach cleans or um, these organizations like the reclaimers in South Africa. And the specific behavior would be initiating a beach clean and inviting people to join. So now we identified our specific behavior. So instead of saying I want to reduce plastic pollution, I identified my behavior. And for example, I said, OK, I want to focus on reducing the amount of plastic cups, um, single use plastic cups, and I want to encourage people to use keep cups. So how do I know now what the behavioral drivers for my specific behavior are? And um, Sabine Pal and Kaylee Wiles published a paper 2017 in analytical methods and here they line out um, beautifully what kind of methods you can use to identify behavioral drivers they can be qualitative like interviews or focus groups but they can also be quantitative with surveys where you can um, measure psychological drivers like um, perceived risk or social norms um, and you can also set up experiments where you compare different interventions against each other, like an intervention group and a control group, and you can see how effective your intervention is. An example for qualitative research um, also comes from Plymouth University. And what Anderson and her colleagues did here was that they extracted the microbeads from facial scrubs and they put them into these little glass jars. And what they did then was that they showed these little glass jars to three different groups. One group was beauty professionals, then students and environmentalists. And what they found was that the knowledge of these people was very different. Only the environmentalists knew, or some of the environmentalists knew, that these little bubbles in the cosmetics are plastic. Um, all members of the other groups thought that that would be sand or natural materials like nut or salt. Um, however, all the groups showed um, signs of shock and they were all very concerned. They discussed about consequences for the natural environment, for the fish, for example, um, and they were also discussing about solutions. Another study did something similar. So here Henderson and Green interviewed people from the general public from different sectors about their understanding of microplastic and plastic pollution. And what they found was very different uh, levels of knowledge on plastic and microplastics in different groups of people. And what they also found was that most people associate plastic pollution with these big garbage patches in the ocean, these plastic islands. Um, and what they also found, and that is really important, is that people don't make the um, relation, the connection between their own behavior and plastic pollution. So this connection between I act, I use plastic, and picture connection is usually missing. And why is this research important? It is important because we have to know that different groups have different perceptions and we have to consider these different perceptions and the different levels of knowledge and understand people's mental models. What do people think? Where does plastic come from? Where does it go? And um, this is very crucial for developing communication techniques and for developing solutions, because we can use people's knowledge as springboards for our own communication techniques. 
this example is a very different approach. It is a meta-analysis. So um, Lea Heidebreda and her colleagues looked at all the research that was published during the last 10 years, and they tried to extract the drivers of plastic-related behaviors. Like, for example, people using plastic um, as plastic bags or plastic cups. Why do they use those? What are the psychological drivers of plastic usage? And they found that habits, convenience, and social norms were the most common and strongest drivers of plastic use, plastic bag use, for example. They also identified what I said before, this awareness behavior gap, which means that there is a gap between my action and plastic pollution. So there's something in between that is a black box and people don't bridge this black box usually. And um, also that more research is needed to evaluate interventions. So the behavioral drivers that they found here, the habit, convenience and social norms are drivers of plastic usage, but not the predictors or explaining the success of an intervention. And this is something that is still missing. So we need to design interventions and try to reduce plastic use but we also need to evaluate if these interventions work and see um, if they are successful or not, and then report it to the scientific um, community. I won't go into detail of many of those behavioral drivers, but I would like to talk about social norms because they are a bit hyped as a superior driver of um, behavior. And this is because humans want to be similar to other humans and we all want to belong to our in-group. We want to be um, yeah, part of our group, part of people that are similar to us. And the problem with society today is that in most countries, plastic use is still the norm. It's normal to buy products that are packed in plastic and it's normal to ask for the takeaway cup. And as long as this is the case, people will still behave the same because there's research showing that people, for example, litter more in an already littered environment as compared to a clean environment. If the environment around me is clean, I'm less likely to litter. But if there are already lots of items on the floor that people left there, I'm more likely to leave my rubbish on the floor as well. This study also comes from Plymouth University and it was done by a PhD student, Sophie Noya, and she looked at different recycling behavior depending on different bin types on a festival. So there were the normal bins, those are the ones on the bottom right. Then there were bins that had a little sign on top telling people what they should put into those bins. Then uh, on the top right, there are bins that show the items that should go into the bin. Like they had the items stuck on top as examples. So this is what you should put into this bin. And then there are bins that had a volunteer standing next to them. And this volunteer wasn't supposed to interact with people. He just stood there and watched. And the most successful recycling behavior was found for the volunteer stuffed bin. So as soon as there's someone standing next to the bin, people recycle better. And this points towards the power of social norms and of social um, control in that uh, sense. Interestingly, as far as I remember, people started putting their rubbish on top of the bin for the bins on the top right as well. So that's another little pointer towards social norms because um, they thought that that's the appropriate behavior and they put their little boxes of drinks or something on top as well. Another example of social norms is here from uh, Saba, from the city of Sampona on the eastern coast of Borneo. And I collaborated with politicians a couple of years ago, and the goal was to reduce littering in the city. And what they did then was instead of using a fine, what they did before, people had to pay when they were caught littering. Um, instead, people had to put on a little vest with the word monier on the back. This means monkey in, uh, in the local language. And um, they also had to pick up litter in the street for one hour with this vest on. And because people were laughing about them and it was quite a shameful experience, the littering in that city went down significantly. How can we um, combat convenience? It was also found that a main driver of uh, plastic pollution is convenience and we could use nudging. Nudging means you make the environmental behavior more attractive and um, more easy and more salient. The example on the top, for example, um, makes the 
choice of a, fr a piece of fruit more attractive as compared to the choice of chocolate bars because they're further back and people would have to bend forward or maybe even ask the person on the till to give them the chocolate bar as compared to just taking the banana. This is also a way of nudging and apparently it reduced the spill, um, the little fly reduced the spill on the bathroom floor of 80%, but I don't know how they actually measured that. Um, and in terms of plastic pollution, how could we use nudging there? So instead of just packing everything into plastic bags in the shops, you could make consumers ask for a plastic bag. And um, this was tried in Namibia and an observation of more than 3000 um, people. And we found that the um, plastic bag use was reduced for 23% just by not directly packing everything into a plastic bag. And that's a very cost-effective way of reducing plastic pollution. Another way that is often used in the media are fear messages, so scaring people. Um, and so for example, similar to the little pictures on the cigarette packaging, you, put, you could put pictures on plastic items. However, it is really important to always pair fear messages with empowerment and with solutions, because otherwise, if the fear is too high, people go into a stage of freeze. And if it's too low, people are bored and they won't act. So you have to find the optimum level of fear. And um, so emotions can be a really good driver of behavior, but why not use positive emotions? Positive emotions can also be a very good driver of action and um, you don't have the negative side effects as you might have with fear. An example that was put up to the media by the Plastic Soup Foundation is this one. I think it's really, really powerful and it relates to a paper that was published that found microplastics in the human placenta. However, I think that this advertisement is, um, we have to really look at it with a pinch of salt because first of all, there's no evidence that plastic causes birth defects. So um, this statement is simply based on no evidence at all. And it's really um, dangerous to put these messages out because it scares people. And also what are people supposed to do if they see a powerful message like that? It is terrifying. And, um, but there's no solution paired with it. People will probably go away after they saw this message and not really know what to do. So they will be scared, they will feel helpless, they will feel concerned, but they won't have anything to act. And it is really important to tell people about solutions, especially after you scared them. And identifying the ideal behavior is the first step. So um, using a behavior that is both easy and impactful. So um, an example of a pro-environmental behavior that is easy would be switching off the light. An example that is impactful but quite difficult is um, for many people is uh, stop eating meat. And an example that is somewhere in the middle that is impactful and relatively easy would be, for example, using the bike for short trips instead of the car. An example from a collaboration that I had a couple of years ago with a whale watching company, Futurismo, in the Azores, was that we tried to identify a good behavior, how to reduce the plastic pollution on the islands. And it, we identified refilling water bottles as a very suitable behavior for this case because the islands are hot and many tourists are using little water bottles for like for drinking water because they didn't know that the water on the islands is perfectly drinkable. And um, then many of those little bottles ended up in the ocean because the islands didn't have a very good recycling system. And by using the positive experiences when they saw the whales and the positive emotions to tell them that they can also use the water from the tap and refill their bottles was an effective mechanism to in to decrease plastic bottle use and to increase refilling behavior. This is a report that I want to talk a lot about. It is by Earthwatch from 2019. And what they did was to identify the most littered items and to enumerate a whole range of solutions. And they always identify the best 
um, solution, like the one that is most powerful and the one that is most easy. I have to hurry up a little bit because I'm almost out of time. Um, I know that some of the other webinars talked about plastic bands and technical solutions and biodegradables, and I would like to put a little bit of a behavioral um, yeah, dimension on it. So plastic bands uh, have been implemented all around the world, but the success is a bit so-so because it is key to communicate um, to people and also to give them good alternatives. So even if there was a plastic ban established in Thailand, for example, a couple of years ago, there are still about 61 million lunch boxes made of polystyrene, which is like the worst plastic um, material because it cannot be recycled and it really takes ages to, um, to biodegrade. Um, or not biodegrades at all, um, 61 million lunchboxes are used every single day in Thailand, even if there was a ban. Then relying on technical solution can actually lead to the diffusion of responsibility. If you think that technology will save us, then you might not change your own behavior. And there's a lot of misconception and confusion about biodegradables. If you brand something biodegradable, the consumers might actually think, oh, it's fine now that I can use this biodegradable. And there might be a rebound effect. Maybe people use more of this material or they litter it. But if a biodegradable plastic ends up in the ocean, it won't biodegrade at all because that's not the environment where plastic biodegradable plastic can biodegrade. It can only biodegrade in very specific environments. So we need to prepare society for changes like this and to get citizens on board as well. I would like to, um, before I finish, actually point out two studies that I brought with me. Um, one is from Namibia. Um, here, Namibia introduced the plastic bag levy in 2019, and we recently ran a study to see what actually pe what th people think about um, the plastic bag levy and how the plastic consumption is in Namibia. Interestingly, we found that most people that we asked didn't even know that this levy exists. So it points towards a big communication error between the government and the consumers. Also, the majority of people still bought a plastic bag instead of going for alternatives. And the small group that went for these alternatives, those were the ones who already had sustainable habits, who had uh, high and pro-environmental attitudes and high self-efficacy. So those were probably those environmentalists, but not the broad population. And even if many people thought that the levy was introduced to reduce plastic pollution, 25% still thought that it was for the government to make money or for shops to make money. So they thought it's some kind of corruption. And again, knowledge about plastic pollution did not predict sustainable behavior. And what we concluded from this research was that we really need to bring people on board if we want to um, yeah, introduce new laws or um, yeah, communicate good behavior to people and um, the acceptance for new laws can only be reached and optimized if people are involved and understood. Communication back best practice um, is, I will actually move on to the next slide to make it quicker, but those are the seven characteristics of communication best practice, making it simple, visual, relating it to local challenges, um, having a social dimension, emotions and solutions and connecting it to the audience. And what we did in Palawan was testing those seven criteria and see which ones of those are most important. So we co-created together with the community, we co-created communication pieces and we tested them against each other. Here on the left hand side, you see some examples. So they were about different environmental challenges and um, we evaluated them in terms of design. And in terms of effects, like um, do people want to change their behavior when they see that and show them on social media and so on. And what we found that the best communications were the ones that uh, had emotions in them, um, emotion evoking, like positive or negative emotions, and the ones that had a clear behavioral message, so a solution on them. But even more striking, I found, was that um, the fit between the message and the audience was actually one of the most important criteria. So um, not every message it will be effective for every audience. Your message has to fit to your audience. And this is why it is so important to know who you're talking to and to adapt your strategy. 
this was uh, what this slide is about. So it is important that you think about who is my target group? Who am I communicating to? Is it politicians? Is it students? Is it tourists? What do these people want? What is their goal? How do they communicate? Do they use a certain language, certain narratives? And how can I emphasize what is in for them? And a good way of actually creating these communication strategies is to co-create it with the people that you want to communicate to. Those are different examples from the Blue Communities projects where we co-created different communication strategies. One is a comic book that is against dynamite fishing and it was co-created with uh, artists from the region, from Sabah in Borneo. And then there are songs and murals about sustainability challenges developed by community members in Tai Tai in Palawan in the Philippines. And if you wonder if those strategies are actually effective, they definitely are. So this example on the left is from the Malisco study. It's across 15 European countries and they had a creative contest with school kids and they reported more sustainable after they creatively engaged with the topic of plastic pollution. And we had similar effects um, in the creative engagement in the Philippines. So the intention to behave sustainably and um, to take responsibility for your actions increases after you creatively engaged with um, a sustainability challenge. My last slide, um, I will hurry up. This is just to point out it's important to evaluate your ideas and to pilot your ideas because sometimes there can be unintended effects that you don't really want to have. This one was an initiative from Canada where um, some people thought it would be a great idea to print embarrassing messages on plastic bags so that people would stop using them. Unfortunately, people found it so funny that they started collecting those plastic bags and actually started asking for them. So the use of those plastic bags increased even if the um, actual intention was to decrease it. This one is a message from a German newspaper where they talked about the export of plastic waste. And I know from several of my family members in Germany who after reading this article, who the article probably intended to raise awareness, but the reaction of um, many people in Germany was, oh, I will stop recycling completely. So they just simply stopped all the recycling behavior. And that was definitely not the intention of this article. And this one is an example from my PhD. I wanted to use social norms to encourage people to buy sustainable seafood. Unfortunately, my little signs in the supermarket have been mistaken for advertisement. And people thought now it's, um, it's some kind of fish week or um, seafood week. And I did not increase the rate of sustainable seafood consumed, but of seafood consumed in general. So all I did was boosting seafood sales. And what I actually wanted was um, encouraging people to make a sustainable choice. So it's important to pilot and evaluate your um, approaches and interventions. And I would leave you would like to leave you with the following key messages. So human decisions and behavior are definitely playing a key role with tackling environmental challenges such as plastic pollution. There is no one fits all solution. You have to get to know your audience. You have to understand decisions and behavior. And a very good way is to co-create with the communicate with the communities and to co-develop these approaches. And we do not have to invent the wheel again. So we can build on existing research, use approaches that have been used before and work across disciplines and yeah, together we can hopefully decrease the plastic pollution. And I would like to thank you for your attention and also thank my amazing colleagues in Blue Communities and uh, Gobabab and the uh, Plymouth Marine Litter Unit as well. Thank you so much, Isabel. Um, that was that was incredible. And I think it's very valuable to know that there is such a thing as environmental psychology and to know that these kind of studies are being conducted. Um, I think the, the feedback from consumers on things like microplastics and the biodegradability of plastics and all that kind of thing is very, very important. Um, there are a few comments in the chat that says, uh, fascinating talk, thank you. And then there's a question that says, what about the effectiveness of financial incentives for recycling? Behavioral change is often influenced by what's in it for me. Do you have case studies uh, 
um, on how effective such schemes are, for example, deposit systems uh, for returning plastic bottles in return for an incentive? Yeah, um, so very often, especially when we collaborate with economists, we hear that um, by monetizing, like putting financial incentives on it, that might solve the problem. And there is evidence for that. In some cases, it definitely helps. And um, yeah, incentives can boost behavior. The problem is it's an external um, external incentive. And as soon as you would take that away, the behavior stops again. So the evidence shows that an external incentive like that um, helps in the moment, but it is not helping to boost the intrinsic motivation of people. So they only behave accordingly as soon as the incentive is there, but when you take it away, they stop. And it's also important to find the right level, how high this incentive should be. If it's too low, people just ignore it. Like um, when the when people had to start paying for plastic bags in Germany, in the beginning, people stopped using plastic bags, but after a while you adapt to um, paying these 5p or what it is, or 10p, and um, you start using them again. So it's only for a certain time that a financial incentive works, unfortunately. Uh, thank you, Isabel. Uh, there's a question that says, is there a particular behavior cha behavioral change model that you would recommend um, for conservation for NGOs with limited resources um, and budgets? Um, yeah, there is this uh, path, it's called path model. Um, and that one is really good. It kind of shows the whole process of like first identifying your behavior, then identifying the behavioral drivers, and then creating um, the interventions and also evaluating them. Um, yeah, I think it's called PATH model that uh, is used by several NGOs, also, for example, by the WWF. Uh, thanks, Isabel. There's a, another comment that says, uh, thank you for the very interesting presentation. This was just a breath of fresh air. We do have a situation where society generally uh, do not like to be told what to do and will do the opposite if the messaging comes from officials. How could we counter this form of anti-establishment? Maybe by establishing some community role models, like um, instead of the top-down messaging, um, find people that are accepted by the community who could kind of function as role models or as uh, block leaders um, who demonstrate the positive behavior and then maybe get other people on board as well. Yeah, I understand that uh, it is difficult to follow something that is uh, just put on top of you by the government and not really explained and then you have to follow so yeah uh, it's quite understand quite human actually to reject that in the first place thank you isabel and uh, i particularly enjoyed the examples that you used of plastic bags um and the methods they used to try and discourage people from using them and how that backfired a bit um <laughs> thank you so much everyone for joining